My understanding of the Buddhist conception of love is that it is a kind of delusion, an attachment with attendant negative connotations. If this is the case, how could we characterize the emotion motivation which impels a bodhisattva to be reborn? Well, love, love is not delusion. And again, back to the Abhidhamma, love is, um, love is a word and is ambiguous because um, most often in the West we're referring to eros, right? Eros, which eros, which is um, lustful love, or, or or not even lustful, but just desire for something. I love apples, or I love my wife, or my girlfriend, or my boyfriend, or whatever. Or I love my children. Adoration and so on um, is often unwholesome, not delusion, based on delusion, but is uh, craving or greed-based, desire-based. Um, and so that's unwholesome um, but love that is a desire for beings to be happy wishing for them uh, to be happy or acting the impulsion that impulse Im that uh, push moves us to act for the benefit of others this is metta and this is a positive state it's wholesome it's worldly it won't get you to nibbana but it's wholesome and if cultivated can eventually lead to uh, limitless love for the whole universe and which can lead you to be born as a Brahma and can give great states of concentration which are also beneficial to the practice of insight meditation. So, um, depends what you mean by love, but the emotion motivation that impels a bodhisattva to be reborn. Okay, um, the reason a bodhisattva in the Theravada tradition is reborn and I'm assuming you're talking about the Theravada Bodhisattva without the V because with the V in there it gets kind of weird and, and the Mahayana conception gets pretty radical but um, what impels a Bodhisattva to be reborn again is delusion and defilement the only reason we're reborn is because of some kind of attachment now all that a Bodhisattva has done is refused to um, listen or to to accept an enlightenment that is devo that is void devoid of omniscience. So, uh, given given the opportunity to become enlightened in this life without being omniscient, he dis, dis they discard it. Uh, there's that. Now, what Im what moves them to do it? Um, Again, we, so now we have to distinguish between bodhisattvas. Some bodhisattvas are not going to become Buddhas, and they make a determination to become a, bodhi, become a Buddha and are unsuccessful. And often these determinations that they make are based on ego or desire or whatever. Um, in the case of our Buddha, he made a vow out of, I guess you could say, wisdom and confidence uh, and faith because he was a highly developed ascetic who had magical powers and, and insight and he knew with certainty, with confidence that if he listened to the Buddha's teaching he would become an arahant very quickly, right away um, and so he made the determination to go one step further, to go the next step which was a huge step uh, out, of, out of wisdom and understanding it's interesting, curious to note that as soon as he became a Buddha, the, one of the first things he thought of was not um, taking advantage of his omniscience, was to pass away into Parinibbana, which, you know, w he would have saved himself a lot of time had he just done that back in the time of Dipankara Buddha. But um, the result, but but the result of his omniscience was such that he wasn't able to do it because immediately. He was asked to teach. Brahma came down and asked him to teach, because he was omniscient. No one would come down and ask. And Brahma would not come down and ask me to teach, for example, because I'm not omniscient. But he came down and asked the Buddha to teach, and so it was based on this quality. What motivated it? And so again, this is it. It differs from from person to person. But the real bodhisattvas, it would seem, they do it out of confidence and and wisdom. On that occasion where they are recognized and where the, the, another Buddha says, see that guy's lying in the mud, he's going to become a Buddha in a future life and so on.